Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out today for our third panel of our six panel series. Um, my name is Aaron Henry. I'm the planning director for the town of Lexington. And before we dive into the discussion, I'll just take care of a few housekeeping items. Restrooms are just outside the door if needed. We've got some light refreshments, although the donut selection this morning was not fantastic at Duncan's. So <laughs> hopefully somebody takes the spring fling frosted thing. Um, if not, I'll do it after the uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Has anybody been to one of these already this spring? This is the third. Is any who's come to the first two? Excellent. So some of you know the deal. Um, out front there, hopefully you signed up. Um, we'd like to add you to our little uh, comprehensive planning email list. There's also these uh, mysteriously blank blue cards. As to these panels are conversations about kind of the regional context that we find ourselves in. Um, you may have a Lexington specific question. Feel free to put that on the blue card and leave it with staff. Uh, I should also recognize David Kucharski, the assistant planning director. Before you leave, if you have a question on a blue card, find one of us, slip it to us, or leave it on the table and we'll catch it. Um, so hopefully the questions that you, you have when we get to the Q&A, um, we, we're not really prepared to answer super specific Lexington questions, but obviously if they're contextual, hopefully the panel or staff can answer that. Um, a little bit about the comprehensive planning process. So. We got an appropriation last year at annual town meeting 2017 to embark on a complete redo of the comprehensive plan. The last time the community did one was in uh, the 03, 04 time frame. There was a lot of planning activity in that time frame. Um, and it's been a long time since then. There's been a lot of demographic change. There's been a lot of metrics that have evolved. The region has evolved. Um, and so rather than frame this as an update, this is really a complete redo. And while staff has been behind the scenes, um, we've formed the Comprehensive Planning Advisory Committee. Um, we're also working on these, what we're calling trend reports. Um, we're trying to pull in all of that socioeconomic data so that when we get into larger community events uh, later in the fall, we'll have that information available for you. This first phase, while we're pulling all of that data together, we wanted to kind of set the stage for the region. Um, and these educator panels are, are, that's the purpose of these. So we're doing three topics twice each. So we're doing housing, economic development, um, and housing today, and obviously. Transportation. 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 You said housing twice. <laughs> I was just away for a week, so I apologize. Um, that's how important Early Monday is. morning. Twice. <laughs> right. So we're doing each panel twice, one in the morning, one in the evening, to kind of hopefully get uh, better participation across the community, as some people can't always make the evening meetings. Um, really pleased to have a very distinguished panel this morning. Um, and I think if there's no procedural questions, I will turn it over. Um, to Kyle Talente at RKG Associates. We um, partnered with RKG to help moderate the panels and kind of put this all together. We really <coughs> appreciate um, that help. And these have so far gone really well. If you have questions about the comp plan in general, we have a website, um, lexingtonma.gov backslash comp plan. One word that'll take you to the home page for the comprehensive planning effort. We have everything there, all the meetings that we've taped, all the uh, materials that we've provided to date, they're all there. So if you want to get up to speed, you can spend a lot of time doing a lot of homework there, and you can find it all. You'll find our contact information. If you have any questions about how to participate or any questions at all, please don't be shy. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Kyle. Excellent. Thank you, Aaron. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank you all for coming, and just in case you're curious whether or not these are pre-scripted, I'm going to basically repeat a lot of what Aaron just said, so uh, my apologies to that. Um, but uh, thank you for coming to this third in a series of six panel discussions about economic development, transportation, and housing. Um, my name is Kyle Salenti. I'm a vice president and principal with RKG Associates. Um, I'm going to be moderating the two panel discussions on housing, the one today and one to be scheduled into the future. 
Um, the idea behind these initial educational panels is to help provide a broader perspective on the trends, opportunities, and challenges that communities, businesses, developers are facing related to each of these three topic areas. And so as Aaron said, it's a way to try and get some, some background information, some context as we move into the comprehensive planning process. I am <clears throat> RKG Associates, just a little bit about us. We're a planning real estate consulting firm. Uh, we were founded in 1981 in Durham, New Hampshire. Uh, we now have principal offices in Alexandria, Virginia, downtown Boston, and Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we've been working with local government and private sector clients uh, throughout New England and throughout the United States for a little bit uh, short of 40 years. Um, you probably have already met Eric Halverson and Craig Seymour, who are moderating the, the other two topic areas uh, for our KG. Each panel is about an hour, which includes a mix of questions that were developed by us and with town staff. And we have reserved about 15 to 20 minutes. If you participated already, you know we've reserved some time at the end for questions from, from the uh, participants. Uh, uh, to, to steal another term that Aaron uh, said before me already, a few housekeeping issues that they asked me to bring up. One is please refrain from asking questions during the first 40 to 45 minutes, as we will have some time for questions at the end. And secondly is, uh, to reiterate Aaron's point, is also uh, please try and have those questions addressing in the area larger than just uh, Lexington per se. Uh, when the town goes through the actual comprehensive planning process, that's when they'll be addressing a lot of those very specific town issues. Lexington is a very interesting community when it comes to housing. Your location right off of Route 128, Route 2, makes it an ideal location for folks that are looking to find a place to live and work right here in the corridor or to commute to um, other employment centers along uh, Route 128 or even to downtown Boston and Cambridge. Uh, that being said, and its popularity and its uh, strategic location creates the issue of Lexington has a very high housing prices, particularly in owner-occupied housing. And that creates a barrier for folks who are trying to look uh, to find a place to live here that may not be able to afford at the top end of the, of the income scale. Uh, it also presents a barrier, frankly, for those who are living here or lived here for a long time and are looking to age in place in the community and trying to find something that's a little bit more mod modestly priced or finding something that's a little bit smaller than what they have now. About 80% of the housing supply is single family detached homes. Um, of that, 84% have a value over half a million dollars and 27% have a value over a million dollars. So you can understand the challenges that that could cause either for someone who's not in that income bracket or someone who's lived here and, and wants to find something maybe a little bit smaller than the large single family home that they have. Buildings with three or more units make up only about 15% of the town's housing stock, providing few options for those who do not want that single family home or can afford it. And compounding all of that is your occupancy rate, or excuse me, your vacancy rates here are very, very tight. Uh, it's about 0.3%, and I want to say that slowly again, 0.3% for owner-occupied housing and about 2.6% uh, for rental housing. And just to give you some context around that, in this marketplace, typical or healthy is about 2% for ownership and 6% for rental. So you can understand the challenge is compounded when you look at not only do we not have enough supply, but we, there's not enough being turned over to keep the, the market active. The members on the panel who I'm about to introduce recognize that housing in Massachusetts is a regional and statewide challenge, and they also recognize the fact that while Lexington has a role to play, ours is but a part of the larger issue that the community in general, the Boston metro area and the state of Massachusetts, is trying to address. So with that, I'm going to introduce, and, and we did not sit in order of the, uh, the order of my notes, so my apologies for that. Uh, two over for me is Professor Barry Bluestone from Northeastern University's Dukakis Center. Barry is the Russell B. and Andre B. Stearns Trustee Professor of Political Economy in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University. He served as the founding director of the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy from 1999 to 2015 and the founding dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs from 2006 to 2012. At the Dukakis Center, Professor Bluestone led research projects on housing, local economic development, state and local public finance, the manufacturing sector in Massachusetts, and an evaluation of the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center. He has been the lead author on each of the 15 editions of the annual Greater Boston Housing Report Card. As a political economist, he has written widely in the areas of income distribution, business and industrial policy, labor management relations, 
higher education finance, and urban and regional economic development. Immediately to my left, uh, going out of order, is Ms. Karina Milchman. Um, AI oh, I'm sorry. See, I told you. I get totally thrown off with the order here. Um, AICP and the Chief Housing Planner at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, or MAPC. Ms. Milchman joined MAPC in 2014. She works in the Land Use Department managing the Housing Division. Karina's efforts focus on expanding and diversifying the region's housing supply to advance local goals and the regional equity priorities set forth in MAPC's Metro Future Plan. This includes providing direct housing and planning, technical assistance to municipalities, and contributing expertise to inform the agency's legislative priorities at the state and federal level. Her areas of expertise include issues of neighborhood change, barriers to affordability and housing production, and retrofitting suburbia. And finally, immediately to my left, is Ms. Chris Clutchman, the Housing Choice Program Director for the Department of Housing and Community Development. Chris manages the Baker Polito Administration's Housing Choice Initiative, which rewards local governments that are producing housing. Prior to this role, she worked for the Town of Westford for seven years as a Director of Land Use Management and Town Planner, where she oversaw high levels of development activity, an increase in staffing, and as a surprise to everybody, several controversial projects. <laughs> she worked in Oregon for the first half of her career, including co-founding a planning firm and working for a regional planning agency. In 2016, Chris was recognized for outstanding contributions to the field of planning as a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Let's all give a warm welcome to our panelists. All right. Finally, I don't have to say much anymore. So I'm going to open up, I'm going to lead a series of questions. This first question, I would like each of you to take a minute or two to address, and then I will randomly pick on you, or excuse me, call on you. Um, could you briefly describe a bit about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and your involvement with housing in Massachusetts? Thanks so much. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I, so in the Housing Choice Program in the Baker Polito Administration, I think one of the most important things I do is I meet weekly with interagency group, um, a working group uh, made up of Department of Revenue, um, in Energy and Environmental Affairs, at my agency, DHCD, um, the Governor's Office, all sorts of folks, and we meet and we brainstorm how the program is going. So the Governor just announced my program in December, so it's emerging. Um, and so obviously that group um, developed the program, but w as, as we're rolling it out and implementing it, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, we get together weekly. It's really tough. It's Fridays from 3.30 to 5. This is a very, very dedicated group, but it's also a group of high-level people, including the undersecretary, a couple undersecretaries, and that's the time frame in which they could meet. So I think that's the most important thing that we do, that I do. I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, after a 48-year teaching career at Boston oh. College, UMass, and uh, Northeastern, I taught my very last class on Wednesday. Oh, I'll still wow. be at Northeastern, too. <laughs> um, but as you heard, um, I, I was brought to Northeastern University from UMass by the new president at that time to set up a center devoted to Boston and the greater Boston region and the Commonwealth. Um, and that was as Northeastern was becoming, once you know the big commuter school was becoming uh, the big national and international university, uh, but um, President Freeland was worried that we'd forget where we were, that we lived in Boston, that we lived in greater Boston, that we lived in the Commonwealth. And he wanted to make sure that Northeastern was committed uh, to the community. And so I was brought, because I had set up the public policy PhD program at UMass Boston under his direction when he was at UMass, uh, and we set up the Dukakis Center, which uh, has, uh, was renamed after Kitty and Michael in 2008. Um, quickly, um, six months after I arrived at Northeastern, I get a call from none other than Cardinal Bernard Law, pre-scandal, pre-Spotlight series, and asked if I would meet with him. And he said he was also going to have the president of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, uh, Paul Guzzi. And so we met in the Cardinal's Chambers uh, on Lake Street in Boston, and the Cardinal in his beautiful vestments, and Paul in his three-piece suit, and the Cardinal says, we got a serious problem, Barry. We have a moral dilemma because we have no longer housing for the people who are in my church. And Paul, a good Catholic, waited until the Cardinal was not looking at him and says, I don't know anything about ethics or morality, but I know we got a business problem. we got an economic problem. 
And so we ended up writing the very first major comprehensive study of housing in Greater Boston called A New Paradigm for Housing in Boston. And in it, we looked at a lot of the problems we have, many of them we still have, like zoning, and uh, which is what the governor's package is, is all about. Um, we looked at the cost of housing, and the major thing I did as an economist statistician is I built a model based on vacancy rates, actually that showed that we would need 38,000 additional housing units in Greater Boston over the next five years, over and above current production, if we wanted to stabilize prices. And that caught the attention of the Boston Globe. It was the headline. We then had a conference with 1,000 people, with then governor and the mayor. And six months later, uh, the Boston Foundation came to me, the major foundation in the city, and said, Barry, 38,000 units. How will we know who's keeping track of whether we're winning? And that's how the first Greater Boston uh, housing reporting. We've, we followed all of the towns and cities in the five county area of Essex, Middlesex, Norfolk, Plymouth, and Suffolk counties, of course, including Lexington. And um, we've done it every year. And every year we keep track of prices, we keep track of production in terms of new uh, housing uh, permits, we keep track of the demographic shifts. <clears throat> and every year we also do a special chapter. Um, for instance, an issue of student housing or homelessness or foreclosures when that was a major issue. Um, and we just last November finished our last. So that's what brings me here. I'm going to continue working in this area. Um, I don't know if there'll be a 2018 housing report cut. That's still being discussed. Uh, but we'll continue to do that. And the last thing I do is I'm, uh, I spend a lot of time going around Massachusetts, uh, sometimes out of the state. Uh, for groups just like this, but I want to really congratulate Lexington for this series. Uh, I wish every town uh, in Greater Boston would do it, but good work, guys. Hi, everyone. I'm Karina. I'm very happy to be here. I work at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. As mentioned, I oversee the housing division there. We're the regional planning agency for Metro Boston, so that's 101 cities and towns um, basically inside that 495 ring, including Lexington. Um, the housing division does a lot of planning and technical assistance work, which has our planners going out into the field, into communities like Lexington, to facilitate various planning processes, ranging from big comprehensive plans to small neighborhood plans or transit-oriented development plans around commuter rail stations or other MBTA stations. Um, we do a lot of housing production planning and sort of everything in between. The housing division also works with our government affairs department on <coughs> sort of shaping the legislative agenda each year and that includes things like zoning reform which was mentioned before and I'm sure we'll come back to. We also do a lot of data analysis around housing trends, uh, demographic shifts, um, demand projections, a lot of toolkits um, used for purposes of facilitating dialogue, um, raising awareness, understanding how to address various housing related concerns and issues from um, how to manage gentrification and neighborhood change and avoid displacement to how to um, think about housing vis-a-vis -vis economic development and revitalization for downtowns or town centers, um, things like that. Also, as the regional planning agency, we do a lot of work around regional collaboration. So um, we were involved in the founding of the Regional Housing Services Office that Lexington is a member of. Um, and we are right now working with various metropolitan mayors, mayors for the inner core, around um, developing a regional housing production target for those 15 communities and then working with them sort of one-on-one -on, -one on what kind of actions they might pursue to move the needle in the right direction locally in terms of expanding and diversifying their housing supply. So we do a lot of different things at MAPC, um, and the, the sort of consistent uh, element throughout is about uh, creating housing opportunity for people, um, within sort of the unique context of each of our 101 localities. Excellent, thank you. So Karina, hang on to the microphone. Yep. Since you have it, I'm going to start with you on the, the, the first uh, topic question, which is what do you see as the biggest housing challenges facing Greater Boston today and into the future? And then after you have a chance, you know, please feel free to, to add on. 
Um, that is a big one. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, on the one hand, we're seeing some real changes in demographics in the region. We have a lot of, a shift towards smaller households. Um, so even if we don't see population growth, which we are seeing, um, we need more housing units to accommodate these smaller households. So instead of six people in a housing unit, we have two or maybe three. Um, and they need different kinds of housing, and the region needs more units to accommodate them. Um, however, we're really not permitting housing at the same rates that we once were in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, I think there's a perception that, that we're building a lot of housing, and, and um, you know, in discrete <coughs> circumstances, we are. You know, I, I, no one can deny the big development going up across the street. But when you zoom out to the region, we're really not permitting as much as we used to. And so we sort of have, have this dual dynamic where we need more housing to accommodate more in smaller households, but we're not building it. Um, and I think that has led to two serious problems in greater Boston, to answer your question, um, which is sort of a lack of housing opportunity for people and a lack of housing diversity. So much of the housing supply across the region, really once you get outside of that Cambridge, um, Somerville, Boston area, is single family housing and large single family housing, um, which doesn't work for these smaller households. And uh, in addition to, or I guess related to that lack of supply is an affordability crisis. So we have a lot of people who simply can't afford the housing because they don't earn that income. Um, they're you know, lower income households or moderate income households. And we also have, uh, you know, maybe they work in the service sector, maybe they're, they work you know, for the, the municipality, they sort of make your town run, uh, teachers, policemen, firemen, uh, the usual suspects. But we also have um, a lot of new talent coming to the region that needs housing and are sort of on the earlier end of the age spectrum and don't have the resources to buy a large single family home even if they needed one. And then on the other end of the age spectrum, we have you know older, older residents, uh, baby boomers, who need to downsize. They want to free up those larger single family homes for the families. Um, and you know maybe they don't want the responsibility of maintaining a very large home. It's expensive, it's a lot of work. Um, and they don't, have a, they don't have a smaller unit within their community so that they can age in place. Um, so I think that's sort of the, the swirl of issues that we're trying to deal with. Um, exactly right. <laughs> that's exactly what I would have said. I'll, I'll, let me put it in, in historical context. <clears throat> we are in the midst of what I call the third demographic revolution in Greater Boston. The first actually began in 1870. Uh, between 1870 and 1920, just in 50 years, the population of the city of Boston, which has not expanded beyond 43 square miles, uh, tripled in population from a quarter of a million to 750,000. And we pr housed pretty much everybody who came, mainly Irish and Italian and Eastern Europe, and immigrants. And we came up with a housing design perfect for them called the Triple Decker. Triple Decker still makes up 40% of the housing stock in Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville combined. And it was perfect because you had uh, immigrants, possibly your grandparents or great-grandparents, who came here, and they didn't have much, but they got a job, they built up a little bit of uh, savings, and they were able to buy one of these very inexpensive triple-deckers, which were built very cheaply, and rent out two units to either family members or others from their village or their shtetl. So it was perfect <coughs> housing for the demographic revolution. <clears throat> the second demographic revolution begins in 1945. People are returning, GIs are returning, men and women from overseas. They're coupling up 10 years younger than we do today. I have a 26-year-old son who will give me a grandchild by the time I'm 130, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they, they came back and they formed families very early. They were having their first child between the ages of 23 and 24, they were a woman. And they were moving to the suburbs. Uh, Boston's population plummets from 801,000 to 560,000. Lexington's population explodes. Burlington sets a record. 
between 1950 and 1980, it explodes by 10 times, from 2,400 to 24,000 people. Oh, and we design housing for them. Not the most attractive, the Levittown, suburban, you know, two-car garage, small place, uh, but it worked perfectly for them. And now we have the third revolution that Corinne talked about, which is exactly the two of us. <laughs> 20 to 34 and 65 plus, right? And that's all the growth in the greater Boston region through at least 2030, according to MAPC projections. And as Corinne said, we don't have housing for them. Worse than that, what has happened, not worse, is that we've been, we have a powerful economy. <clears throat> when I first got here to Boston from Detroit, Michigan, which at that time was the richest city in the United States in 1971, right? I come to Boston and I'm astounded how poor the city is. I go to a real estate, a rental agent. I've just arrived at Boston College. I'm a young assistant professor. And Boston College is Jesuit and they pay young assistant professors the same as priests. The difference being that priests actually get room and board and they take on a vow of poverty. <laughs> and the result is we didn't get paid very well, so I went to a rental agent that was uh, suggested by one of my new colleagues. I said, look, I'm coming from Detroit. I, you know, I don't have any college debt, but I don't have a lot of money, and I'm at Boston College where they don't pay a living wage. Can I find some housing? He says, no problem, Bluestone. <clears throat> he then says, with all honesty, do you mind a high crime rate? He said, I, wasn't, I wasn't partial to homicide, but what do you have He said, well, I got a place here in Boston, which I think you'll like. It has a very low homicide rate, just has the highest burglary rate in the city. But I can get you a beautiful one-bedroom apartment with a parking space for 204 months. And I moved into 379 Marlboro Street, Back Bay. Oh. Now, if I bought that house rather than renting it, wow. I can promise you I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> I'd be on my 140-foot yacht in the Caribbean. But that was Boston. It was SROs, and it was very, very poor. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that what's happened since that time is the industries that brought Boston back, the Boston Renaissance, I wrote a whole book about it, were, of course, higher education, which back in the 1960s and 70s was still a small industry. Medical care was 8% of GDP. It's now 20% of gross domestic product. Financial services, the first uh, mutual fund, was set up in 1922 by MFS, Massachusetts Financial Services. <coughs> but nobody really owned any stock or mutual funds until the 1970s and 80s. That explodes. And then we get biotech, and before that, of course, we got Route 128, and we got the Wangs and the digital equipments and so forth. And what that did is it revolutionized Boston more than any other city. But what it did is it attracted, we're in from New Jersey, and attracted um, hundreds of thousands of graduate students, undergraduates, young professionals, and so forth. Um, they've come here, thank God. But they are marrying, they are coupling much later. They're marrying and having children much later. They're living often with roommates. And what have they done? They've taken over the triple decker housing market. When I moved into Trowbridge Street in Cambridge with my late wife 31 years ago, I used to love Christmas. I'm Jewish, but I love Christmas. And every one of the triple deckers was decorated beautifully. One is now decorated by the only family that still lives. All the rest are young professionals and so forth. I'll get back a little later to talk about how we solve that problem. <laughs> but it has to do with how do we find housing for these two generations? And it's very different housing than the typical housing stock we have here in Lexington. Chris, in your opinion, why is housing such a challenging topic in many communities? What barriers need to be overcome for more communities to be accepting of new housing? Perfect well, I, question. I get the easy Chris. one. <laughs> Um, I should say, I mean, I don't know if it was covered in the introduction, I've uh, been a Lexington resident for the last 14 years, so I'm truly happy to be here um, with my, uh, my, my, my people. Uh, um, so also as a professional planner for the last 30 years, um, I know that change is really one of the major issues and that makes things controversial. And so what people get kind of comfortable with and when things are going to change, that is really very difficult. Um, and Barry's just talked about like a whole bunch of, you know, kind of historically how things have actually kind of changed and what you think might be the kind of um, status quo isn't actually, may not actually have been the status quo 20 years ago. So one of the things that I want to um, talk about uh, for sure is that um, zoning, uh, which is a kind of blueprint 
for how dense we are, um, where housing gets built, where, where mixed use gets built, where, di where, where stores are, uh, where new growth is going to be. And when you think about Lexington, you might think, or you know, Lexington specific and then everywhere else, there are other towns just like Lexington. Um, you kind of think that those things are kind of baked in and maybe they should stay that way. Um, and, and people get kind of afraid of change. So one of the things I want to point out is that in order to change, it's very difficult to change zoning if we want to do something a little bit different. Um, it takes a super majority to change zoning in town meeting. Um, and so that, and that's, you know, 67%. It's very difficult to get that. You might have a majority of town meeting members who say, we want to get this change done, but you can't get that super majority. And again, there's an aversion to change, there's an aversion to things that are complicated. Zoning happens to be one of those things that's kind of complicated. And yet we ask town meetings to um, take it on, or, or if you're in a city, you ask the city council to do that. So um, being able to explain complicated things and explain change. And I just want to give an example of my neighborhood here in Lexington. I live on uh, Forest Street, uh, which is a really great neighborhood. It's right in the center. When my kids were growing up, we just sent them to Mario's with a credit card and said, please bring back the pizza. We'd be really happy. Like, we're having our glass of wine on the, on the porch. Um, and that neighborhood um, could not be rebuilt today. The zoning for that neighborhood is calls for larger lot sizes than actually exist. So when the subdivision of Forest Street between Mass Avenue um, all the way to Waltham Street happened, um, it was the lot sizes were allowed to be smaller. It's a really popular neighborhood. The houses go like that. Uh, we're within walking distance of the high school. It used to be within walking distance of an elementary school. It's now condominiums. But um, that is just an example of how people kind of don't necessarily even want to recreate the zoning that is one of the most popular neighborhoods here in Lexington. Oh. <clears throat> I'm so glad you said fear of change because that, that, was, that was my buzzword I was going to bring out. Um, I would just add on to it, or related to fear of changes, is um, concerns around development impact. So, you know, part of it is we want things, we like things the way they are, we don't want them to change. And part of it is, well, how much is it going to change if we let this project happen? Um, and I think. I think the sort of mentality around development impacts, part of it is, is real, right? There are real impacts to some of these changes. And um, rather than taking a stance, you know, well, therefore we can't let it happen, because chances are it's going to happen no matter what you do. The question is, how is it going to happen? We think about these real development impacts of, well, how do we address them? Is there a way that we can um, take on these development impacts in a way that brings value to the community or minimizes some of the um, concerns. And then some of the development impacts are perceived, and I think that's a real barrier to um, addressing the housing challenges in communities too. And I think our job there is to in, you know, hear the concerns, hear the perceived um, impacts that may not actually come to bear, and inform, right? Well, I understand that concern. Um, we have some data that indicates it's probably not going to happen, um, and here's why. And so I think that's sort of two big responsibilities to take on related to fear of change and development impacts is, you know, addressing the real impacts that nobody wants to deny and sort of addressing some of the misperceptions around those development impacts. And I will say, building upon what Barry mentioned uh, in his opening statement, is it's events like this. It's that education, outreach, and in information sessions are critical as a step needed to overcome those barriers. Because the more information you give to folks, whether they're elected officials in a decision-making capacity, or they're residents of a community that are just concerned that they don't want to see things that they value in their community go away, if they don't have good information to be able to understand the difference between the real and the perceived, it makes it very, very hard to make choices. So I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I wanted to build upon something Barry said, that these, this is one of those ways that you address those challenges. Because housing is a visceral issue. It's very emotional. We're very tied. If you're a homeowner, you, you, feel, you feel a level of, of, uh, of uh, uh, um, uh, control, if you want, of your community, and even as a renter, you just want to, you've moved here for a reason, 
and you want to see those reasons be maintained. And so that information education, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Sorry for editorializing. <laughs> Barry, I want to come to you. This is a question I think is right down the, the pipe for you, which is what <coughs> impact do you think housing affordability and availability have on the Commonwealth's ability to compete for business and talent? Um, so far, I have to admit, uh, not much. I mean, we've still been able to attract the young people here in large numbers. But over time, this is going to become a more serious problem. What it, what it has really caused, and I'm glad that the other thing you're talking about besides housing is transportation, is it's causing the terrible transportation problems we have here. And the reason is, housing has become so expensive in the core, Boston, Somerville, and Cambridge, that working families are being forced further and further out to towns like Brockton, Quincy, Lynn, and so forth. In fact, this may amaze you. The town of Lawrence, last year, median home prices rose faster in Lawrence than Lexington. Uh, the whole rent and housing curve is dropping down as more and more people are trying to find housing they can afford for their families. The result, of course, is they're traveling more and more. I'm doing a big transportation study now. Uh, my associate director for nine years before Charlie Stoller is Stephanie Pollack, our Secretary of Transportation. She had one last study to do for the Barr Foundation on how do we fund public transit. And one of the things I've been doing is looking at the numbers, and some of you know this well, if you commute, is that the average commute time on the arteries around Boston, the average commute speed is now down to 18.4 miles per hour. Give you an idea, I used to race bicycles. I still ride at 73, and I travel about that speed. Okay? On the Southeast Expressway from the Braintree Split to downtown, the typical commute average speed is now 10.4 miles per hour. But that's only if there's no construction or an accident. And that's all because the core has become so expensive that people are moving further and further away. And we have a full employment economy, so more people are commuting to work. I mean, even yesterday, Sunday, um, the traffic was just staggering, and I have to drive to a lot of places, like here this morning. So that is really the serious problem that I worry about. But I want to add something to the other issue around zoning, and that is the cost of construction is soaring. Um, two years ago in our housing report card, we were able to get proprietary information from 12 of the largest developers who do development here. They're like Corcoran Jenison, they're like Wynn, and they were willing to give us full, this, you know, if we kept the, we can't give you specific details for every one of their projects. But what we found is if you look at the all-in cost, which is land cost, dealing with zoning, which can be very expensive in terms of lawyers and so forth, and time, uh, construction materials, construction labor, and the developer fees. We are now up to just under $300 a square foot for standard construction of multifamily housing. Well, for a 2,000 square foot unit for a family of four, you're talking $600,000 to build a unit, right? The triple-deckers today, at the price they cost, adjusted for inflation, be about $170,000, adjusted for inflation to 2016. So we have that problem as well, and part of the reason that I've been doing so much work on this is I've been thinking about how do we bring that cost down. And one is making zoning easier, particularly because of what the governor is trying to do in terms of uh, giving incentives to communities that you might talk about to get them to uh, deal with zoning. A second is finding ways of building housing less expensively. Turns out that we are still, if you go out and look at any new housing going on, it's built exactly the way it was built 70 years ago. You'll still see people with hammers and screwdrivers and all that. That's nuts. Average productivity in single-family home construction has gone up by 0% in 70 years. Average productivity, output per person, efficiency, has gone up by 300% in the economy, 800% in manufacturing. So one of the things we've been doing with a lot of the construction firms, including Suffolk and Gilbane, is thinking about are there new methods of constructing really high-level, very <coughs> high-quality housing? but doing it in using manufacturing techniques, using new, new techniques that are being used all through Europe, particularly in Spain. So if we could get the zoning fixed, if we could find a land that's available for new housing, particularly multifamily housing, and we can get the construction costs down, we can once again begin to solve 
this housing problem. I'm just going to jump in and add, and um, you know, one of the great things about housing panels like this is, you know, I make just um, very, very, very respectfully um, disagree slightly um, based on my own experience that there, I think there is um, an impact to the high uh, housing cost and the you know, very, very limited supply we had, as Kyle, you know, described. And that's from my experience as being a community development director. I would meet with businesses that wanted to come into the town that I was working for, and they would look around and they'd say, okay, well, what is the housing? And they said, well, we we don't want just, you know, so we tell them, you know, and, and this is a 495 town, so it's a little less expensive than the inner core here. And we would kind of say, okay, well, you know, here's our median housing price. And they said, well, we can't, you know, we can't bring our workers from Cincinnati here. They, they, they're paying, you know, half of that for their housing. And they literally would kind of, they have to pause, didn't necessarily always affect a decision, a go or no go decision, but they really took pause at the high cost of housing and the um, level of the, the lack of um, the inventory, the lack of inventory. Um, so, you know, one of, they're thinking about how easy is it going to be if I'm going to have to move my folks, um, and, and that really does um, impact our economy. And, and the other piece is that we're also losing the young people um, that cannot afford to live here. Um, my oldest uh, is just graduating from college, yay! <laughs> <laughs> One of three, um, but you know he's 21, and there's no way that he could afford to even rent an apartment anywhere kind of in this general area. So he's going to be looking to other places, Austin, Portland, um, Seattle's actually gotten too expensive, but you know so uh, other places where it's going to be more affordable for him to live. So that's the other piece of it. It's not just people coming in; is that people are leaving the area in order because they can't find affordable housing. Could I just add? I don't, uh, I agree, um, but I, I, I just want to say that if in fact people weren't coming here anymore, prices would stabilize and rents would stabilize. People are still coming here. GE settled here. Amazon may not bring 50,000 jobs, but they just added several thousand more. Um, the hospitals are expanding. The universities are expanding. Um, what it's saying is that somehow we're recruiting people, but the only way they can afford it is three, four of these young people to get together and pay $4,500 for the single floor of a triple decker. So it isn't as though we're, you know, completely shutting that down, but what it's doing is it's destroying housing for the vast middle of our economy. We know how to build housing. Well, I don't call it housing anymore. Millennial Towers, one Dalton is already half leased to foreign speculators. Yeah. And I, I, we, we actually added as part of our housing stock. We shouldn't. I've talked with uh, DND in the city because unless people are living there, it's not housing. It's a bank vault, right? Um, and that's what a lot of the new housing is. So we're building some housing, but it's not housing. And the kind of housing we need, we can't build. Later on, if we have a few minutes, I'm going to talk about the kind of housing that I've been working with with developers in something called the 21st Century Village for us. I would just add um, to the economy piece of the puzzle. Um, I think Barry, you're, you're right. You know, people are finding workarounds right now so that they can take um, desirable jobs and live in a desirable place. And a lot of that is, you know, grouping up in what would be family, otherwise be family housing. But there's a question, or or moving farther out and suffering a really long commute. But there's a question of how long will people be willing to do that for? And if we look at some of our population projections um, going out to 2030, 2040, a huge number of baby booming baby boomers are going to retire from the workforce. I, I forget, <laughs> just like Barry over here, I forget the statistic, but some, something like hundreds, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of baby boomers are going to be opening up millions. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Right, <laughs> opening up job opportunities, um, but they're not necessarily leaving the region. So they'll be staying in their homes unless we create new opportunity for them to downsize. And that poses a real challenge for the region in terms of attracting replacement workers for those baby boomers and not necessarily being able to house the workers that we need to maintain a strong economy. So I think that is a, a challenge that's gonna get increasingly um, tough to address going forward unless we start building housing quickly. Hold on to the microphone. Um, but I get literally 10 seconds to that. Okay. Right, Here's how right. interesting is that we just did this research and we talk about the new jobs that are being opening and that's that's what we most focus on. 
As Corinne said, the real important thing are job openings, not new jobs. 85% of the job openings by 2030, over 1 million job openings in Greater Boston, 85% are just people retiring or leaving an occupation into another, and we have to replace them. And that's a massive education problem, it's a training problem. It will be a housing problem. And actually, one more thing to add, if I might. In addition to the, you know, the mismatch between the retire, the number of job openings due to retirement versus housing vacancies, um, projection workforce projections indicate a real increase in lower income jobs. Um, people who are working in the service <coughs> economy or nurses and so forth, um, and those householders can't afford a lot of the housing that's here. So we really need to up not just housing opportunity in general, but affordable housing opportunity in order to have, you know, be able to um, be home to the kind of workers that our workforce is projected to need uh, to maintain the economy, right, well, not even grow the economy. Hold on to the microphone. Uh, we just painted a very rosy picture of the future <laughs> housing for the metro Boston area. So now let's talk about some solutions. And so, uh, Karina, you kind of kicked off the conversation about our older and younger residents having a difficult time finding price appropriate housing, and we just had a wonderful back and forth. So, how do you think we should go about addressing that concern? Um, well, I think I think we need to build more housing and <laughs> um, more varied housing. So, uh, it can't just be more large single-family homes. It can't just be more, you know, tiny micro units in towers in Boston. Um, we need a full spectrum. Um, they need to be high quality. They need to be universally designed so that they can sort of uh, um, accommodate people from eight to 80. And you know, you don't have householders hitting a certain age and, and need to leave their community or find um, another option that maybe they can't afford. Uh, so I think. You know, the easy solution is just build more housing and more varied housing. Um, I think specifically, uh, we need um, all of our municipalities to play their part. So it is a shared responsibility. Boston can't do everything. Lexington can't do everything. Um, this is a regional problem, and we need to address it as a region. I think Chris will talk about some strategies um, for that, that the state is offering. Um, locally, I think communities like Lexington, um, there are a number of strategies that can be effective in terms of expanding and diversifying the housing supply here, a lot of which Lexington's already doing. You know, I want to give credit where credit is due. Lexington has a lot of really strong municipal housing tools, partners, um, C CPA, um, you you go through the various planning processes, which is the beginning of, of having this kind of dialogue to build support for making these kinds of changes. Um, zoning, I think, is an area that all communities in the region can look at in terms of figuring out how to facilitate more and different kind of housing. And um, I would say, you know, looking at accessory dwelling units, which is sort of a lower impact way to expand and diversify your housing supply for whether it's young professionals or retirees, <coughs> give them an income stream. Um, having you know a more relaxed accessory dwelling unit bylaw that isn't just for blood relatives um, <coughs> is, is a strong tool. And I think also thinking about zoning that facilitates both um, multifamily, whether that's low or moderate scale multifamily, um, or smaller single family housing topologies. Uh, is really important, sort of that missing middle um, housing stock. So I'll, I'll leave it. Thanks, Karina. So um, I do want to talk about um, a couple things, and they're going to be. I'm going to get a little technical here, so bear with me, and you can ask questions at the end. Um, I want to talk about um, some. Karina already mentioned zoning, and so I'm going to get really specific. So there's um, programs that the state has called the 40R Smart Growth Zoning Districts. Um, that calls for higher density housing, um, but is appropriate in a place like Lexington Center. Um, so it's uh, 12 to 20 units uh, per acre, which is kind of about what the Lexington Place, the mixed-use um, development that has the nail salon and the coffee bike shop, 
Um, they also there's a new um, portion of starter homes that was um, uh, put into the legislation in 2016 economic development bill um, that allows for starter homes at four units per acre so this is a new piece of the 40r legislation that I think might find a place that it might fit in Lexington somewhere if there's a rezoning um, of some areas um, four units an acre um, is kind of a good good size um, Lexington does a great job. They participate in the Regional Shared Housing Office, which um, allows for you know, really good capacity and, and good professionals to um, uh, advise you um, for housing. But most of all, I want to talk about the um, governor's um, legislation that he filed when he started the Housing Choice Program, and that is an act to promote housing choices. Uh, and that um, basically takes a look at the problem that I identified, which is how difficult it is to get a supermajority. Uh, and that um, this legislation calls for, if you're doing zoning amendments that will increase production, for example, changing your accessory dwelling units to be a by right, um, having multifamily by right, um, down, uh, uh, reducing the dimensions um, or reducing parking requirements um, for housing. Um, instead of needing a two-thirds majority, it would need a simple majority. And so for those certain zoning amendments, instead of needing to get that higher level, you just need um, the lower level. It's not for all zoning amendments. It would be just for zoning amendments that produce more housing. Um, and this would change um, the Zoning Act, Chapter 40A. So it would just change the law. And so that would be the law across the Commonwealth. Um, in addition, of course, I um, could mention my program, the Housing Choice Program, which designates communities that have been producing housing and then makes uh, money available to them. Um, so I'm from the government and I have money and I'm here to help you. Uh, and if you're a Housing Choice community, I have a new capital grants program that will be providing competitive grants of up to 500000 starting in fiscal year 19. Um, I think your regional shared housing staff is working on this, um, but the uh, deadline for my program is um, in one week from today. So anyway, um, those are some of the some of the best practices. Let me just add one quick. Thing. I'm I'm very proud to say that I was one of the authors of 40R and uh, 40S as well. But the whole idea was you may remember in 1968-69 in a totally different era, we passed a bill called 40B, which most communities here hate. And what 40B says is that if a community doesn't have at least 10% affordable housing, HUD affordable, um, and a developer comes into town and wants to build housing and the town stops them, they can circumvent the town, go and get a comprehensive permit from the state, and build it anyway. It's a real powerful stick. And quite frankly, towns and cities hated it. It did get housing built. When we, in 2003, 2004, started coming up with 40R, there were three of us, uh, Ted Kerman, um, uh, Eleanor White, and I wrote that bill um, and got full support. We got 100 percent. We got a we got full 100 percent vote in the House and the Senate, and we got Mitt Romney to sign it. And the whole idea was let's let's do a carrot in addition to a stick. And what the Smart Growth Overlay Zoning District Chapter 40 does is it says if a community agrees uh, to create a new zoning overlay district in any part of town where denser multifamily housing with some affordability can be built, the state actually will give that community additional local aid, up to $600,000 is the initial. And then if it, they get a developer to come in, they get another $3,000 of additional local aid for every permit built. That's pretty good. At the end of one year, we got one community to take advantage of it after it was signed. So I went out and I talked, I think I came to Lexington in fact, I went to several communities and said, what's the problem? And, and, and people like you got up and said, well, we're afraid it will work. I said, what do you mean you're afraid it will work? <laughs> well, we're afraid that we'll build one of these things. We'll, we'll, we'll do an overlay district. A developer will come in. They'll put in all this housing. And then hordes of people come in with thousands of children, and they'll destroy our school system. So we came back, and we did Chapter 40S. And I said, well, I'm an economist. Whenever you feel that something is going to be very harmful, your car will be stolen, your house will burn down, you'll die, what do you do? You take out insurance. So 40S is an insurance scheme, which is still on the books. And it says if something like that does happen, then the state will pick up much of the additional cost of those students over and above some additional property tax you might get. So what I uh, really I wanted to applaud uh, Governor Baker and uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito and you is expanding this idea of using incentives and basically rewards for good behavior in order to be able to solve this problem. And I think with this legislation and with your good work, 
I think we're going to get more communities taking advantage not only of this, but of 40R and 40S. And that will begin to have some impact on this. So last question. Um, it's for each of you. You have 30 seconds to, to respond. <laughs> and I have my watch with a second hand on it so I can tell. Tell everybody one best practice that we haven't already discussed uh, that you've either seen in another community here in Massachusetts or from around the country that a town like Lexington may want to consider. And this could be anything from affordable housing, senior housing, housing for families, workforce housing, public housing, etc. One, 30 seconds, go. I would just say Lexington has two transit routes and I would increase density along the transit routes. Um, I can't go into detail, but we've been talking about this 21st century village mm -hmm. for young people and for me. And we're talking about having the governor and mayors and other city officials and town officials get together, working with developers, working with uh, great architects to develop new forms of housing uh, that can meet our needs. And then working, for example, in the inner core with universities and with the teaching hospitals and some of the large employers to not only market this housing, but ultimately even take out uh, joint master leases to make the financing. That is, they would guarantee occupancy. Northeastern would be one of them. And so we're starting to think about ways of dealing particularly with the demographic challenge of these very young people and, and people like me who want to downsize and find new forms of housing and finding new coalitions to build it. Um. Two great ones. I'll add inclusionary zoning, which I don't believe Lexington has currently on the books. Um, particularly in tan is that is that right? Particularly in tandem um, with a strategy like Chris uh, suggested, where you're going to create greater residential development opportunity at key locations, um, because inclusionary zoning really is most effective with multifamily development, even small or scale multifamily development. And that would require market rate housing developers to set aside a certain uh, number of affordable deed restricted units in those um, developments or off site or make a payment in lieu of providing those units. Um, and that would be a great way to uh, expand your affordable housing supply here in Lexington and in a community where housing costs are really, really very high. Excellent. Um, I do apologize, we did start a little bit late. I, I, I have been blessed with a loud voice or cursed if you ask my wife. Um, so uh, I haven't been using this very much, but um, we did start a little bit late, but I do want to open the floor if you have questions for the panelists. Yes, sir. <clears throat> What's missing for me, so you're, you're operating at a fairly high level, and we're down here on the ground in Lexington. I don't know how much you're looking into, not, nothing special about Lexington, whether it's any other town. And you touched upon it, Dr. Bluestone, <clears throat> and that is the nature of demand for housing, town by town, not, not in a broad brush. And Trowbridge Street, by the way, if you lived on Trowbridge Street, that's pretty good. That's not difficult. So <clears throat> if you look at supply and demand, or maybe I should say supply and demand, like <laughs> this in Lexington, <clears throat> any, any opening uh, in terms of housing will be plugged uh, by people with money, basically. So, so it's very difficult to uh, uh, introduce uh, people with lower economic capabilities. So, and I hope we get to this with our uh, comprehensive plan, but for me, we need to understand in detail, in detail by town, the nature of the supply of housing and the nature of demand. You talked about the investors, that's one new, and that's happening a little bit in Lexington too. We have some base, <coughs> vacant two million dollar houses that are purchased by investors. Uh, people want to get their money out of other countries. Here in Boston, it's even worse. So, so that's what's missing for me, that, that kind of detail analysis. I hope we get to that in Lexington with a comprehensive plan. I don't know if we will. Let me just, um, let's look at the demographics again. So I, I actually looked at the demographics for Lexington. Um, in 2016, 18.1% of Lexington residents were 65 or over. Uh, that compares with 15.1% in Boston, 15.1% also statewide. Um, in 2000, there were 5,767 residents over the age of 65. By 2016, it was up to 5,961 
Um, so that older age population is rising. Uh, I think one of the things we've suggested here, and it could actually add a tremendous amount of stock, is in the bigger homes in Lexington, make it as of right the ability to add accessory units, which would be affordable for young people or possibly another old person who's not blood related to move in. So we take a housing <coughs> stock, which already exists, but we do some minor conversions into it, add another kitchen, for example, perhaps another bathroom, maybe not even necessary to do that, and we actually are expanding the housing stock without expanding the actual number of units. So that's one way of doing it. The <laughs> other is, is when I started talking about this village idea, I kept calling it a graduate student village, and I wanted to get Northeastern and BC and Boston University Dallas to work together to solve this problem. Because they house about half their undergraduates, but only about 8% of the 100,000 graduate students in Greater Boston are housed. They're living in the, com in the community. The only ones who do it are Harvard and MIT, do some graduate student housing. Um, and then somebody in the audience got up and said, but what about us, Bluestone? And I said, yes, not just for young people. We could build this kind of housing for mixed income, mixed age. The vision I have of these villages is, you know, um, in the larger ones in the inner, you know, in Malden, in Quincy, because our graduate students don't have to live right on campus, would have, let's say, a Trader Joe's on the first floor and some stuff on the first floor. And as you went from the lower floors to the upper floors, you'd go from smaller units to larger units. You'd go from Formica to Granite. I have graduate students who are starving. I've got graduate students who are beeping out of the way in their Ferraris because their parents come from Abu Dhabi. <laughs> and, you know, they're sending them to Northeastern. And they could buy one of these very expensive or rent one of these very expensive penthouse units. But they'd probably just buy the whole building for cash or maybe part of the zip code. <laughs> so we need multi-income, multi-age, multi-forms of housing in the same way that we develop, as I said at the very beginning, housing that was demographically appropriate <coughs> with the triple-decker and then demographically appropriate after World War II. We have to do that again. Just to um, further elaborate, I think one of the things, you know, when we talk about zoning, um, zoning kind of sets the table. Um, and it kind of says, here's, here's what we want to have in our town. And if you don't set that table, and if you have high or large lot sizes that you know, are the zoning, you don't allow infill development to come in, or you don't encourage um, somebody to redevelop a commercial property that may be kind of tired with a mixed use property, um, uh, the zoning is kind of how you do that and how you communicate that as a, as, a, as a municipality. And so that's one of the things that you can get to, um, is just look at the zoning and make some changes. Yes. yes. Uh, out of your four faces, I can see her face. It's this frustration that you can, you have a good job, you have good pay, but you cannot live in a community that you wanted. I consider myself a Los Antonia. I moved in 24 years ago, so don't get upset with me. Like <laughs> the other day, the man behind me, he's French, came from Paris. And he and I, I wasn't even raising the problem. He said, this New Englander, they're so constipated. <laughs> me, including me. So why can't we be more inclusive? Uh, I believe, I solemnly believe, Lexington School is so good because we have Chinese, Indian, Jewish, you name it. And you go to conquer the town, you go and walk in there, and you're like, oh, this town doesn't belong to me. And the school is not as good. So bring people in, let them be here. School is not going to go down except going up, OK? so. Include that. I want to live one day in Lexington. I want to see women wearing hippies push their children down down the street. Let's do that. Yes. Excellent question. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, a point that both Korean and Barry have made about the accessory apartments, I'm pretty sure that, that we did relax that a few years ago. It's a good town meeting. Um, so it's just that it hasn't been it hasn't been addressed that much. Not many people have taken that opportunity. I'll, I will repeat it when she's done. I'm going to listen and then I will give it all. Um, so that has been addressed. One thing I, I have, I feel like I want to say about um, it's been characterized kind of by all of you that the, we're resistant to development in Lexington because of fear. I don't think that's an appropriate um, uh, response to our hesitation. Uh, if you look at 
the development that has been going on, dense film that has been going on, it's not addressing any of the issues that you're talking about. Um, they are oversized and they're overpriced. They're not senior housing. It's not affordable housing. It's not a starter home. Um, they're not three-deckers um, that would be appropriate for, for many new young families coming in. They're all overpriced and oversized, um, even in the dense development. And the idea that you're going to say to an older person that lives in a 1,500 square foot house that moving to a 2,700 square foot unit is downsizing <laughs> and that they're going to spend 1.1 million on it, it doesn't make sense. Well, I think you get a lot better response from people if some of the development that, that, that we have been opposed to would be addressing some of the diversity issues that are, that are happening. 40S backwards. So, so Lexington has a really good school system. If we wait for development to harm the school system, that doesn't make any sense for us. If we had, if we had access to government money um, ahead of time to build schools at a rate that would keep pace with the growth that is being encouraged. That would be great, but that's not what's happening. I understand, I understand, sorry, and uh, Chris, um, you were saying that, that you're part of the government and you want to offer money, but we need to have it up front. If, 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 if they want Lexington to bear some of, you know, a fair share of the burden of um, housing needs, then schooling needs need to be addressed first. You can't just say, okay, have all these people move in, and if your schools are harmed as a result, then we'll give you money. It takes six years to build a house, and it takes six months to fill, I mean, to build a to build a school, and it takes six months to fill it. Um, one thing we had over at Esterbrook, we just built our school a couple of years ago, and <coughs> before it was done, there was a housing development that replaced two households with 12. I, 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 that so, doesn't so out, that we're, we're going to have some responses. So yes. in case you didn't hear everything that she said, her first comment was that um, a while back, town meeting addressed the, relaxed the accessory dwelling unit issue. Um, so I, I would imagine as you go through the comprehensive planning <laughs> process, you'll review whether or not that was enough or appropriate to what we've been talking about here today. And then the second thing is that, that, that development is not addressing the issues being identified, which is needs for seniors, need for uh, families of modest in or more modest income than we have today. And then the final comment was, um, which I appreciate as you got more impassioned, you got louder, so everybody Sorry. probably heard this, <laughs> is, is, no, it's a great thing, it's a great thing, is, is the issue of 40S in reverse is rather than saying, if you're affected, we'll give you resources, how about let's find the resources so that you don't have an effect so that you can then accommodate that stuff. So I know you said you wanted to address at least part of that. I don't know if you want to go for all of it, but. <laughs> no, I really appreciate your perspective. Um, there has been some modest housing development in Lexington in the last uh, five and 10 years. Uh, but Lexington's school <coughs> enrollment is increasing at a rate much beyond what's been built because it's a good school system. It's a great school system. People are doing everything they can to bring their families um, to get into a house so they have a Lexington address to send their kids to school. So that's kind of an anomaly in a way. The enrollment is going up much faster than, the, than it would be predicted by new development. Um, so that's just, just a fact. Um, and I do think that, um, uh, you know, your, your point about you know, embracing the ADUs is great, um, Lexington's done some stuff, but uh, how, can, how can Lexington continue to do um, things that bring forward um, rental development, for example, which doesn't require a large capital, which would you know, really provide opportunities. There are limited rental opportunities in Lexington, um, so I would think that in particular looking at rental housing would be helpful. Again, the town, it's a tricky balance. The town does not build housing. The town sets the table by putting the zoning to, uh, you know, to encourage people to build um, or redevelop um, areas uh, with housing units. So I just wanted to make the point about the school enrollment is increasing without, a con um, without development in Lexington. Let me just add one quick 
because that's a great question you raised. I think part of the problem, because I have been meeting with developers, <coughs> is they don't really have a very good idea yet of what the demographics look like and how they're changing. So one of the things I just completed with one of my capstone, we have these capstones for our last semester master's students. We just did a survey of over 800 graduate students at Northeastern who live off campus about their current living situation and what they'd like. They hate the idea that they're forced into living with three or four roommates. They'd rather have a smaller unit that they have their own, possibly even with a shared kitchen and a shared living room. Uh, we got some fascinating data on that. I think we need to continue with more of what we would call demand analyses. What do older people really want? What kind of size? What kind of amenities? At what price point? In what communities? Because the developers really don't know, and the developers are actually behind this survey. They wanted to hear, I mean, it's being sponsored by the Greater Boston Real Estate Board, and they wanted to hear what does the demand really look like, because they're only beginning now to understand these massive demographic shifts we've been talking about, but they haven't figured out yet what they mean for the development of housing. Um, so I'm thrilled to hear that the ADU bylaw here may have been um, relaxed uh, and I imagine as was mentioned that that will be part of the comprehensive planning process to assess uh, the degree of relaxation and whether there's additional tweaks that can be made and as part of that process a zoning audit where you look at sort of how the table is set to borrow Chris's term. If you're seeing development but not the kind of development you want Part of that is, can be addressed through regulation, through your zoning, and part of it is a market demand function. Um, I think the community can do everything in its power to set the table right through its zoning, and I'm sure there are ways to address um, you know, the fact that you're seeing development but not the kind of development, it's too big, it's too expensive, through your zoning. Um, but Zoning can only do so much, and I, I don't want to pretend that it's a cure-all for all the things that you've laid out. Um, to sort of intersect with your er earlier comment around, you know, what is the demand? Um, in a market like Lexington, it's easy to build at the very, very high end, and there's tools to build subsidized deed-restricted affordable housing for lower-income folks that you want to take advantage of, right? Inclusionary zoning being one. To get possibly being one. To get at the moderate and middle income households, that's a whole nother ball field and it's very challenging in a market like Lexington where the cost of construction, as Barry mentioned, is so high and the market demand is so high. You can build a unit and have, you know, however many wealthy households bidding it up. Um, you know, a lot of um, a lot of what we're seeing now in Lexington and in the region is the listed price for a home is just, you know, the basement level to start a silent auction on that home. <laughs> so they're going, you know, sixty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars more than they're even listed at, which means that people who want to buy in don't even have a sense of what markets they should be looking at. Um, so anyway, not not to be all doom and gloom. Um, I think. I think the, the lower income side of things is, is a, is a way, um, the end of the spectrum that the town with a capital T can facilitate development there. If you want to look at some of the moderate middle income, there are things you can do through your zoning, like if you had inclusionary zoning, a set aside that was at 100, 110, 120% of AMI, um, in addition to below 80% of AMI, um, area median income. And then the other, the other way to do it is the so-called um, naturally occurring affordable housing through smaller house, housing units, um, whether that's single family attached, detached, or multifamily, and through accessory dwelling units, whether that's in the existing you know, primary dwelling unit or you know, in a carriage house, in a garage, or whatnot. Um, so you want to set the table through your zoning to allow for those kinds of house, housing units. Um, but again, they're not, if it's not deed restricted, it's a market of what people will pay for it. And so the, the rationale is if it's smaller, people are going to pay less. But it depend, if demand is so pent up in Lexington, it'll still go for a lot of money. Um, 
And so you, you just got to build more to yeah. relax some of that demand, and not just Lexington, the whole region. Well, and I, I think that's a very important point, Karina, is <coughs> the fact that Lexington is not going to solve this problem, that everybody has to take on a piece and, and do their part, because Lexington could open its doors, frankly, and this community isn't large enough to accommodate the substantial the existing unmet demand, let alone all the stuff that, that's coming in. Yes, ma'am. Um, speaking as a senior, is there a way to legally restrict agent um, for senior housing? I mean, we have had developers that did, what Tina brought up. We've had developers who said that we're going to have senior housing for people who want to downsize. That means that that the main uh, the main suite is on the first floor. And as I brought up at one of the meetings, that seniors don't want stairs, so they don't need the second floor. <laughs> and a one, and just to say that it's for seniors because it's only a one-car garage instead of a two-car garage, is not solving the problem. So, is there a way to restrict um, for ages? I'm going to comment really quickly and then pass it over because I'm sure others know more. Um, there is age-restricted housing for 55 plus. You put a deed restriction on it um, and you have to be age eligible to live there. Um, you can also combine that with a affordability deed rider so it's um, subsidized and um, you have to be income eligible as well. I will say um, one little caveat to that is um, we are seeing evidence from market assessments um, that this this kind of housing is less in demand um, from seniors who because often you're in sort of a little age restricted community it's not part of say the downtown or your town center rather um, and it can be very isolating you're not in um, a, de a, a development with a range of um, ho householders at a range of ages um, so it can be very insular and so we've heard at MAPC from the development community that they've built this 55 plus housing and they've had trouble selling it um, or renting it because uh, seniors increasingly want to be more in the mix of things. Uh, and and I, I will add on that and then we'll get to the next question is there are communities that are experimenting with partial senior restrictions. So 20% or 25% of the units rather than all of them. But that point is extremely well made and it goes back to something that you mentioned is you know, 2,500 square foot senior housing doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but it is true that they're also, they want to be part of a larger, more active community. Uh, a lot of folks, you know, the, 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 the active adult communities where it's a bunch of, you know, cottage style single family homes, it isn't as in demand as is something that may be age restricted, but it's part of development where you have a, uh, a, a Trader Joe's on the ground floor with a dry cleaner and a bike shop uh, because seniors still cycle. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I think one regional problem, I, I, I have four dilemmas as a town meeting member, but one regional dilemma as, that hasn't been addressed at all is the effect of climate change. And regionally, it is fairly likely, if nothing is done to reduce energy and so forth, that large portions of Back Bay and other currently available housing is going to be underwater. And as it once was. As it once <laughs> was, yes, precisely. And so there is a regional problem which we are not addressing, and that is that people are using too much energy. And in the old days, you could walk to work. And there are communities like Columbia, Maryland, and so on, which are designed so that you have a mix of, the zoning permits a mix of industry and uh, housing and so forth, all in a reasonably compact area. Uh, that's a uh, possible solution, but it is something that is extremely difficult to do in Lexington because we have a historic district commission and we have a bunch of people who want to preserve their highly inefficient mid-century modern houses and so forth, which I just voted to help them do in some <laughs> cases. But, but the 
entire zoning in Lexington is designed to basically preserve a single family, no industry allowed anywhere except along Hayden Avenue and so on. And it's also designed in large measure to protect a, a demographic, which I will describe. We have 300 plus millionaires resident in Lexington, and they and their families all vote. And we have seven or 800 people who are well below the poverty level, who some of them don't vote, and some of them are incapable of voting because of health restrictions and otherwise. And so we need to have something that addresses that sort of power imbalance in how people Ooh. vote, <laughs> as well as the uh, other issues related to that. Well, that's not just regional, but national. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I, I, I don't, you were so articulate, I don't really need to say much more other than to point out that when you're talking about the energy, you know, inefficiencies of the single family home neighborhoods where people have to drive, um, what, you know, my one best practice was increase the density along the transit routes. Um, and so where, and this is something that both seniors and families want, is neighborhoods where people can walk. I talked about sending my kids to Mario's. They had sidewalks that they could walk on, they could, you know, and they could get right there, having to live in a nice, you know, in a convenient neighborhood. But if we can increase the density on those neighborhoods, make sure there are sidewalks for folks to be able to walk, um, because whether you're 12 and you don't drive yet, or you're 85 and you've just stopped driving, um, you know, that becomes your way of getting around. Um, I would just add, we talk a lot in this <coughs> field about smart growth, right? So increasing density along transit lines and so forth. The other thing I like to think about is creating more of those mixed-use neighborhoods because the existing ones aren't going to be able to sustain all of the demand. So how do we create more new walkable areas that aren't just 100% residential subdivisions but have, you know, Mario's 2 that you can walk to. <laughs> um, so the, thinking strategically about where there's developable land um, and what land uses to introduce to it, not just a 100% residential or 100% office or 100% commercial, whatever it may be, but mixing them so that those new areas of development are walkable as well. Sir. Yeah, I'm going to get another answer. Uh, Do you know what you I would, yeah, okay. No, you don't. Uh, there's, a, there's an old adage on change, and I think it's applicable. <coughs> that is, you never change something until you know why you have what you have. And uh, we are the victims of our own success. We got here because we did things to make this town what it is. And uh, without oversimplifying, uh, it's, it's been based on the schools. That's why I came here and I'm a little older than the rest of you. <laughs> and, uh, and that part hasn't changed. And that is, we have attracted a population that is dedicated to schools, that's dedicated, dedicated to their kids, that want a little grass around their house. And that's, that's, the, that's what came here. That's what built the city. That's what uh, the town, that's what we're proud of. So the question is, how do we go forward and still maintain that section of uh, society, still preserve that general lifestyle. I'm not saying it stays identical. I'm not trying to run the historic center. But, but not the solution for us is not necessarily the solution for any other community. So we have to design one for ourselves, 
and this we can participate recently, but how do we make it with our personality? Where do you live? Pardon? Tell us about your house. Where do you live? <laughs> now. Okay. I was raised I was raised in a single family house by the reservoir. Yep. I hunted birds where with a shotgun where uh, Bridge School is today. <laughs> Do you still live in that house? Today? No. Today I live in North Lexington. Uh, a, a development uh, from, uh, <coughs> from the late, basically from the 40s. Yeah. And developed earlier than that. My first house lot was 5,000 square feet. We had a lot and a half at 7,500 square feet. And we grew our own food in World War II on it. Yeah. Now, my lot is a 6,500 square foot lot, but I have two of them together, so it's a 13,000 square foot lot. But the neighborhood is 6,500 square foot lots. I laid out subdivisions in Los Angeles, California. And those were 5,000 square foot lots. I called it a horizontal slum. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> Density is going to increase, and you're suggesting it increases. So that's the tricky question. We're not looking for multi-family homes, and we're not looking for 15-story buildings. So this, I think, has to be a very thoughtful process. And anything you can contribute on that basis, I would, I would appreciate. I, I would Thank say you. that that's a conversation that your community needs to have through the comprehensive planning process to decide of what we want to be 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now. Um, I think there's been a lot of conversation already about, you know, smaller cottage-style houses and <coughs> closer development where you do smaller, a lot smaller houses to try and hit that hard middle. Um, but I think those are, that's a valid point to be made that will be addressed as you guys progress through this process of what, what, what is too much, what is not enough, and how do we, how do we find that balance. Uh, Ma'am in the back. So one of the things we haven't talked about today is transfer of development rights. And I know there's some proposals to change legislation and tweak how TDR works. And one of the things that has gotten Lexington particularly upset is when we've lost pristine forests or beautiful open farmland, uh, open pastures. And so I think that's a tool that we could use here very effectively. And I'm wondering if CPA funding can be used for TDR and whether or not there's going to be a statewide um, incentive pool of funds that could be tapped into to facilitate TDR. Did everyone hear the question? Okay. Just wanted to make sure. And do people know what transfer development rights are? Just no. Like, no. Yeah. So you have like kind of a, a, a let's call it a green field, um, and you take the development rights, like so maybe you could grill 20 houses on that green field, and you take another part that's a sending parcel, and you take another parcel that receives it, and so there's an arrangement between the property owners, whether it's facilitated by the town or not, but there is basically a financial, you're, there, those rights are purchased. Um, so the 20 uh, units could go to, let's say, a mixed use development on Merrick Square, um, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a three story, never 15 story, in a, in a, in a multifamily building. And that 20, uh, that greenfield um, gets restricted so that it's open space. So you take the development rights from one and give it to another. Um, so Michelle, great question. Um, the environmental bond bill does include, um, uh, that's been filed by the Baker Polito administration, does include a TDR bank, uh, which is new as far as I know. Um, I'm not sure if there have been other proposals for that, so that is in the legislature. So if you are in favor of transfer development rights, that is the first um, mechanism, <coughs> financial mechanism that I'm aware of. Um, transfer development rights is legal under Chapter 40A. Um, the uh, Governor Baker's um, zoning proposal that I talked about er earlier, I'm sorry, um, the legislation that I talked about earlier, a TDR bylaw would qualify for the simple majority. So again, we're, you know, one of the basic aspects of that legislation is try and make it easier to do the right thing. 
Um, and so if you were to pass a TDR bylaw um, and that legislation passes, it would get a 51%. And CPA funding, do you know if that's... That, I, I'm going to send that one to your town staff to ask your town <laughs> council. <laughs> I, would, I would just add there's another way you can do this besides TDR, and that is really consider in your comprehensive plan cluster zoning. So what you can do is take, you know, uh, an open space, cluster denser housing, but leave a lot of it as open space, which I think is the kind of housing many of us want. We have that. And that's the kind of more development we can do. And as we learn and we teach developers, there's actually a demand for the smaller cluster space units for both young people and us. I think developers will begin to see that this is worth putting up. Now, now, you keep on talking about Baker's administration, and you mentioned 2019. Did Baker in the last four years did anything for the zoning, for more affordable housing, anything? You, you talk about in the pipeline for his sure. next term. Did he do anything the last four years? Yes, uh, so the question is about the Baker Pool administration, what have they, have they been doing? They have actually been putting their money where their mouth is. Um, they have been supporting workforce housing with $100 million to mass housing. Um, they have taken the Mass Works program, which is an infrastructure funding program, um, and prioritized housing in addition to jobs. It used to, it, the Mass Works program used to really fundamentally fund infrastructure for jobs, and they've redirected some of that oh, yeah. towards housing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have all of the lists, but I'm happy to, if you want to take my card, I'm happy to send you more information yeah. about yeah. that. Um, and so they're, they're, and that's resulted in over 3,000 housing see, well, units. Well, uh, well the, uh, uh, yes. I, it is, we are uh, 20 minutes late, which means we are 35 minutes past the time because uh, we started late. I want to thank you all for coming. We are going to have another housing panel discussion in, through this process, and so we can pick that up. Um, if you have specific questions, Aaron did mention the blue cards. Uh, please get them to him. If they are questions that are more geared towards the panelists, we'll be happy to work with you to try and get, get answers. Um, so that we continue the conversation. I will say, as a, as a final statement is, I think this, this last exchange is a proof that we all recognize that more needs to be done at several levels to try and address the needs for housing in our community. I think this was a great first step through your comprehensive planning process of your most recent iteration to see how we as a community, as Lexington, can take on our fair share. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.